Welcome back to Weave Along with Eloise. I'm Eloise of Finchingfield. Are you ready for something challenging? Me too. That's why I'm going to try to speak German again. And you can all tease me mercilessly in the comments. I'm, I'm going to try. The Hochdorf Chieftain's Grave is a richly decorated Celtic burial chamber near Hochdorf in Baden-Württemberg, Germany. It dates from 530 BC in the Hallstatt culture period. This is the same time period that we find the pieces in the salt mines in Austria. Most of the time we think of Celts as being British, especially Irish and Scottish. These Indo-European peoples were found all over Western Europe, found in Poland, Germany, Italy, Spain, and of course the British Isles. But there are also tribes of Celts that were found as far east as Romania and Turkey. These people were identified by their language use and by other cultural similarities. Uh, they didn't have a written language, so there's a lot we don't know about these peoples. We don't understand why their culture expanded so far and why they eventually died out. We do assume that most people were just absorbed into their local communities, into their cultures, and that the Romans had a huge influence in defeating the Celtic people. And there were just pockets of Celts left in places like in the UK where they were able to hold back the Romans and maintain their culture and traditions. As I said, the burial chamber at Hochdorf dates to about 520 to 530 BC, and it was discovered in 1968 by an amateur archeologist. It took another 10 years before they were able to excavate it, but what they found was remarkable. Now, originally, this burial mound was about 20 feet high and 200 feet in diameter, but over centuries of agricultural work on top of it, the mound had shrunk down to about three feet high. Now to completely dispel the myth that all medieval people were short and they died young, the man that they found inside this grave was six foot two inches tall and he was 40 years old. Okay, yeah, 40 years old is really quite young, but six feet tall, holy moly, dwarfs my people. I'm only five foot tall. So this giant of a man was laid out on this huge bronze couch that was nine feet long and it had eight wheels. So judging by this couch, the clothing he wore and all the other objects in this burial chamber, they determined that he was a very important man and probably the chieftain of the nearby village. He'd been buried with a gold-plated torque on his neck, a bracelet on his right arm, a birch bark hat, a gold-plated dagger, uh, some amber jewelry, a razor knife, nail clippers, combs, uh, fishing hooks, arrows, and most notably, some thin gold plaques that were on his shoes. The shoes had disintegrated, but the plaques still remained. At the foot of his couch was a giant cauldron, which had three lions on the edges of it, and it held a hundred gallons of mead. Well, originally it held a hundred gallons of mead, so it's quite a party for the afterlife. On the other side of the tomb was a four-wheeled wagon that had bronze dishes in it, and there were drinking hordes hanging on the wall, enough to serve nine people. All these items can now be found at Museum Altischloss in Stuttgart. The burial mound was reconstructed for the museum using all replicas to give us a really good visual understanding of what these burial mounds looked like. During the construction for this museum, they actually came across the village that this chieftain was very likely from. So. In the building of the museum's display for the Celtic chieftain, they found the Celtic chieftain's home. So these new finds were, of course, incorporated into this new museum. You know, some things are just meant to be. So now the chieftain is home again. In addition to all these riches, of course, that were found in this burial mound, there were pieces of tablet weaving, which, of course, is why we're here today. Aside from his clothes, there were also wall hangings and other textiles inside this burial chamber. Dr. Johanna Bank Burgess uh, analyzed all these textiles and wrote her dissertation on the pieces that were found in this burial chamber. I will, of course, leave a link below so you can read about her analysis of Hochdorf 4, which is a super complicated piece of tablet weaving. That is definitely something on my bucket list to do one day. A reconstruction of this piece had almost a hundred tablets to it. It was six millimeters wide and it was using really, really fine threads. The piece we're going to look at today is Hochdorf 39. It's significantly simpler than the Hochdorf 4. Um, it's a tablet woven border that was found on one of the wall hangings inside the tomb. It uses a skip hole method, and uh, the first time I tried making it, it took several attempts, a couple of phone calls, three different patterns. I struggled, and I swore a lot. 
So hopefully I can show you how to do this in a way that doesn't cause you to swear like a sailor. You're all familiar with this technique by now, so you know what you need. So we're getting down to the last few kingdoms in this Laurel Kingdom project, and today we're celebrating the Kingdom of Ethelmark. Ethelmark was created in 1997 from the Kingdom of the East. It covers most of Pennsylvania, central and western New York, and all of West Virginia. Their colors are ghouls, argent, and ore. That is silver, red, and gold for you non-heralds out there. Or white, red, and yellow if your hordes of precious metals are depleted. It's been a long, lean year for many of us. So this is a big one. You're going to need 36 cards for this project. So grab your cards, your loom, your cup of tea, and two or three colors, depending on how you want to do it, and let's get started. So we've got the loom ready to go. We've got scissors. We've got 36 cards. Um, they're already numbered on the back. I do find for this pattern that numbering the cards on the back does help. Um, I've got the pattern, and I've got all of the threads loaded up in the Lazy Kate, ready to go. And I think that's all we need, so let's uh, let's get warping. Uh, first thread we're going to need is yellow. And the border cards are going to have four threads each, and the internal cards, 3 through 34, are going to be two threads each. So keep that in mind when you're warping. I'll scoot that back just a smidge. All right, we're going to leave a nice long tail, like three or four inches, right at the beginning, and hold it onto that forward peg. Go up and over the pegs. And you guys have seen me do this a couple dozen times. So I'm going to go to the forward peg there, all the way to the back. And remember, there's two pegs in the front here. You can't quite see them. There's a lower peg, and then there's an upper peg. We're going to go around the lower peg, around the tension bar, and back to the upper peg. Grab your scissors, snip. Again, leave a, leave a long tail, about three or four inches. Makes it easier to tie off. And then repeat for the other three threads. Following the same path. If you don't follow the same path, you're going to end up with a piece that eventually is not going to be able to move around your loom. This is a circular warp, which means the end is tied to the beginning, and that means it slides easily around the pegs as you advance through the work. So you'd be weaving up this way, and when you get up too far, you loosen the tension peg and everything slides around all of the pegs forward so that you can start working again. All right, one more for this card. I may have mentioned recently about my Lazy Kate. Um, as you can see, it's it's just a, a box that I got, you know, something in the mail, and I repurposed it. Grabbed a couple of dowels. Um, you can pick them up at pretty much any craft or hardware store. Um, cut them just as long as I needed them to put the spools on, and I just ran it right through the cardboard. Pretty simple. So my cards are labeled A, B, C, D in a clockwise form. I'm going to turn the cards toward me, so to the right, and the first card is S-threaded, and S-threads will go through the back of the card. There are different um, methods for S and Z lettering or, or marking on the cards and on patterns. So you need to know how the pattern is designed um, to make sure that you thread the cards correctly. Otherwise, you're going to end up with either gobbledygook or your pattern will be on the up underside of the, of the work instead of on the top. So once I get all the threads through the card, I tie a surgeon's knot. So it's twice around with the left and then once around with the right. That's a nice firm knot. It's not going to slip out. It's going to stay put and maintain that tension that you need while you're weaving. I'm going to slide all of the threads back. And 
and then that card is done. So now card number two. Now card number two is white. So I'm going to grab a different thread. Again, same path, same method. Follow all the way around the pegs. Back to the beginning. Oh, let's see. What is going on now? Injured my knuckle, so I got a little alley on my knuckle. I just bumped that sore on, on the peg, so that's why I said Al. The bird is awake in the next room wanting to say hi. I can say hi to Smokey. One more thread. Okay, card number two. This one is also S-threaded. Card faces you. Card should face the same direction throughout the whole thing. You shouldn't be flipping them back and forth for this pattern. And it doesn't really matter which order you put the threads into the cards. As long as the right color thread ends up in the right hole, that's all that matters. All right, so I'm going to comb the threads out so they're nice and taut. Same thing with the lower threads. I'm going to scoot these back just a smidge before tying it off. Okay, that's getting in the way. Twice around on the left and once around on the right. There we are, card number two. Scoot them all back, making way, because this is 36 cards. It's going to take up some space. Okay, so we don't need the white thread for a while. Now we're going to be using two colors. We've got red and yellow. Now, like I said before, card number three, things change. So we're going to have two threads per card instead of four, and you can warp them at the same time. So big time saver. So grab your two threads. Again, need three or four inches of a tail. Pinch that down. I put my finger between the threads so they don't twist around each other. Following the same path, back and forth, top to bottom all the way back to the beginning. Snip both the threads. Now B is red and D is yellow. So once again, these are going to be threaded in opposite holes. So B is going to be the red one and D right across is the yellow one. Pull those two threads taut and tie them together. Okay. Scoot them back on the pegs. And other than the placement of the threads in the holes, this is going to be the same all the way through. Red and yellow. And following the chart, we will put the threads into the proper holes. Card number four. Also, having them labeled on the back 
helps you keep track of where you're at on the pattern if you get lost. So card number four, A is red. And C is yellow. Okay, yeah, these are still S threaded. So I lied. There is going to be a change because these will alternate S, S, Z, Z, S, S, Z, Z, all the way across. Card number five. Just like before, A is red and C is yellow, but we're going to go through the front of the card. This is a Z threaded card. Left over right twice. And right over left once. And the cards are going to be all squirrely because of the two threads. Um, it, it looks for the, um, the least amount of tension and sits in that position. That'll, we'll get that all straightened out at the end. After we've got everything warped up, we'll straighten out the cards and use a pencil to hold them still. Just like we have in other weaving patterns. All right, card number six. So what have I been doing lately? I have gotten a, a kid ready to go off to college. Um, she leaves in, well, she leaves in a couple of weeks to go on a Girl Scout trip. And then after that, she gets back and goes to college immediately. Let's see, card number six, B is red, and it's C threaded. So that's pretty exciting. I've got a college student. I've got an older kiddo who's working full time, and I've got a younger kiddo who's in high school. My parents came to visit. They uh, were able to get across the Canadian border and into the U.S. Uh, they've been fully vaccinated, and they stopped by my sister's and visited for a couple of days. They visited my place for a couple of days, and they're heading down to visit my brother for a couple of days. And, uh, yeah, it's all good. Things are getting better. Things are getting better all the time. Anybody watch The Postman? No? Just me? Okay. All right, card number seven. We got seven? Seven. Okay. S threaded again. So we're going to B is red. S threaded. This is one of those patterns you really have to pay attention as you're going along. I'm having trouble separating these. Okay. You have to really pay attention as you go along so that you don't thread them wrong. It's high concentration for this one.
next thing we need to do before we actually start doing any weaving is get the cards all straightened out. Um, and like I mentioned before, the cards, because they're uh, skip hole weave, so the cards are always trying to find uh, its most comfortable place of equilibrium, um, where the least amount of tension is, which means, of course, that they're all at an angle. And you can't weave like that. So I'm going to straighten all the cards out. Now the only way to keep these together is to put a pencil through it, or a knitting needle, or a chopstick, whatever you've got laying around that will fit through the hole and it'll hold all of the cards in place so that you can actually do your weaving with your two hands. I always start with the shuttle sitting on the left side and the tail coming out the right side. That way when I finish a, a repeat, when I get to the end of the repeat, the shuttle is always on this side. And then I can use my handy elastic that's on the frame here and put my shuttle underneath it. So we got the thread nestled in there. It's about a finger or two away from the row of knots. And we're going to turn all of the cards forward, which means I really should have put the pencil in there. But all right, so we're going to turn all the cards forward. We'll throw the shuttle through this way. And then we'll take the tail, the aforementioned tail, and stick it back through the other way. Now, this isn't ready to pull tight yet. So, take the pencil out. I'm going to turn all the cards again. Line them up. Put the pencil through. This is a big old stack of cards. Throw the shuttle through again. Tap it down just a little bit. Not too firmly yet. And we can throw the tail through here again, if you like. You don't have to, but you can. Let's give it a try tightening things up. Oh yeah, that looks good. So you want to tighten it up a little bit. You don't want to squish it too much. And you'll notice that it's got a little bit of the red, yellow, red, yellow look to it, kind of the stripiness. That's what you want. You don't want to pull it too tight and have it all yellow the yellow threads are riding on top right now. All right, so we're going to turn it one more time. I'm going to put the shuttle through, press it down, pull it through. You just pull the tail out of the way because you're not going to need that anymore. Leave a little loop behind, just you know, big enough to put your finger through. Carefully pull the pencil out, turn all the cards again. Pencil in there, press, pull that loop that you left behind before, pull the shuttle through, and leave another loop behind. So we've gone all the way around once. We have AD back at the top again, and we can start doing the pattern. So the pattern starts with AD at the top. So you want to make sure that all of your cards have AD at the top. So let's get started. Picks one and two are the same. All cards forward. Beat down, pull the loop, and leave a loop behind. And repeat. Turn the cards. down, pull the loop, and leave a loop behind. Okay, so now we're going to go with picks three and four. Picks three and four have a couple of cards in the middle that are going to turn forwards, but the rest are going to turn backwards. Okay, so we got cards 17, 18, 19, and 20 that are going to go forwards. And this is why it's really good to have your cards numbered on the back. Of course, they're on the wrong side. Uh, so what was it? 17, 18, 19, 20. So there's 17, 18, 19, and 20 are going to go forwards, and the rest are going backwards. So 
Well, I'm going to turn those ones forwards and put the pencil in there. Turn the rest backwards and press the cards up to the pencil. Now the pencil, even though it's not in the holes, will help hold it in place. So pull the loop and leave the loop behind. And then, because it's a skip hole weave, everything repeats. Turn those cards backwards. Pencil out. Turn those cards forwards. Press. Ooh, that tail is getting in the way again. Pull the loop. And then leave a loop behind. Pick five and six. Now you want to maintain that yellow background, at least that's for mine, I want to maintain the yellow background. So most of the cards are going to be turning forwards now instead of backwards. So one through 14 will go forwards, 15, 16 go backwards, 17, 18 forwards, and 19 and 20 go backwards, and the rest go forwards. So turn the backwards cards backwards, and the forwards cards forwards. Line them up, pencil through, push the cards up to the pencil, and repeat. It's a problem with doing so many cards, so my hands aren't very big. Press, pull the thread, and leave a loop behind. So you can already start seeing that uh, little, I don't know what you call it, the little foot at the bottom of this design. It's very cool. All right, next row. We're going to do this correctly this time. Cards one and two go forward. And a whole bunch of them go backwards. 15 and 16 go forwards. 15, yeah. 15 and 16 go forwards, 17, 18 go backwards, and then the next six go forwards. So one, three, and six, and the rest go backwards, except for the border cards, which go forwards. That was what I forgot at the beginning. So turn those cards backwards. And these cards forwards. Probably shouldn't have put the pencil in there to begin with. Ugh. Turn that forwards. Press. Pull that loop. And leave the loop behind. And repeat. Backwards cards backwards. Forwards cards forwards. Pencil in, push the cards up, press, pull, pull, and leave the loop behind. Picks 9 and 10. So 1 through 9 going forward, 7, 8, 9 going forward. 10 through 16. Oh, going backwards. Let's push those backwards, not forwards. And the next six go forwards, two backwards, and the rest forwards. Oh, see, here we go with that cards wanting to sh shuffle all over the place. that up. Press. That looks 
a little weird. Let me double check the cards there. One, two, three, four, five, six. So this should be 20. Nope, that should be 23 and 24. Okay. Let's back that up. Something doesn't look right. Always good to double check your work. Okay, so 1 through 10 go forwards. Next 6 go backwards, so that's 3. 6 going backwards. 6 going forwards, 3. 6, and then 2 going backwards, which would be 23 and 24. Yes, okay. Let's try that one. Oh yeah, see that looks better. That wasn't looking right for a second. Thing unwinds every pass. All right, and repeat. Okay, next one. Two border cards forward, and then two, four, six, eight backwards. So four, eight backwards, two forwards, two, four, six, eight, ten backwards, three, four, ten, six forwards, three, six, and six backwards, three, six. feels a little high so I'm going to loosen. There we go. Having a slightly looser tension helps you pack the weft down a little bit firmer so instead of getting elongated diamonds like what I'm starting to get you'll get more square shapes like the pattern indicates on the page. And the other option is to use a much narrower weft. I mean that happens quite a lot in uh, period pieces but um, I prefer to just use what I've already got, and uh, so it means I have to pack it down a little bit tighter. Press down firmly, pull that loop, and leave the loop behind. Now, we get to move on to the next one. Six forwards, six back. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen forwards. So three, six, nine, twelve, fourteen, and then twenty-seven and twenty-eight go backwards. And repeat. Always remember to repeat. That's what happens to me every time. When I switch from one kind of pattern to another, I get into kind of a muscle memory, that rhythm, and I end up screwing up a lot until I get into the rhythm of doing this one. So with the last one, the um, Eleisenhof, the one that was twining back and forth a little. So with that one, every pick changed. Every pick was different. With this one, every other pick is different. So to get back into the swing of things, remembering not to move the cards until I've done the second pass. 
two forward, two back, two forward, two, four, six, eight, ten back. That's four, eight, ten. Four forward, and three, six back, six forward, and two back. So when doing the research for this piece, I came across a series on, it's it was originally done, I think, by Discovery or Nova, one of those, um, but it they had it on YouTube. So I'll include the link so that you can go watch it, but it's a whole series of, about the Celts, but it's, it's a very fascinating uh, series. And in the first episode, they talk about this burial mound, and I was absolutely fascinated by it so I encourage you to go check that out because it is it is a really well done series four back two four six eight ten forward three six and ten forward and then we got number 31 yeah 30 yeah, 31, 32, go back. Rest down, and yeah, we've reached the halfway mark in this pattern. That little diamond in the center, very cool. Press. All right, how's yours looking? Does it look like that? I hope so. This is looking very cool. Now, if you want to do something super fun, you could go forwards, just turn all the cards twice more so that BC is at the top instead of AD when you start your pattern, and you'll end up with the reverse of this pattern. So you'll end up with a red background and a yellow diamond, just like you have on the reverse here. So this is a fully reversible pattern, but then you can alternate with the yellow, red, yellow, red all the way through the piece and it looks really striking. So let's just keep on weaving, shall we? But first, <laughs> 